Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, it's a great privilege to uh, get Christoph to, get, uh, his, uh, to, uh, to give his uh, third talk here. Uh, uh, we really made it work this time. Uh, so in our ultra-specialized uh, world, we will encounter scientists who are uh, world experts in the subunit data of uh, calcium carbonin uh, in uh, rats uh, while they have a single day, so Tuesday morning is it's raining. Uh, in stark contrast to that, he's uh, a virtual renaissance man, perhaps the only person in the world who can seriously scrutinize the uh, physics of the video neurons. It's a beautiful book by physics and computation that he wrote at least, uh, all the way to uh, uh, cutting edge theories of consciousness as we discussed yesterday. And then the, the two talks uh, today, uh, the one is starting now with the operating observatories, and the next one, my co is also from the Hanley Institute, I think they be particularly interesting for people here combined with the other two. Uh, to think about potential projects, so I'd like to encourage people to, to think about uh, all the amazing things that uh, 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 computational models, even if computation doesn't exist, uh, all the amazing things that you can do with uh, with, uh, uh, with, with this type of pattern. So, without further ado, Chris. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriel. Yeah, it's really a joint presentation with my junior colleague, Michael Beis, over there, who's going to give um, the, the um, immediately falling talk about the Brain Observatory in uh, much more detail than I will. So uh, what we're trying to do at the uh, Allen Institute is build um, uh, brain observatories in the mouse. This is all, today it's all a mouse, not human, for large-scale cellular surveys. And um, one of the key motivations for doing this is uh, the current reproducibility crisis that we're in. So here I'm just showing you two headliners. One is um, uh, the cover of The Economist, who's a very, you know, a very science-oriented um, weekly publica international publication, Anglo-Saxon publication. And it goes into depth into the, the studies that we all know about. Here's a review from Nature Review Neuroscience that it has been claimed on statistical ground and demonstrated quite often that um, the um, many, probably more than the uh, half, of conclusion drawn from biomedical research are probably false. So we, of course, always believe that's in the other field. We believe it's in fMRI, for instance. If we don't do fMRI, or we think it's in psychology and in priming, or we think it's in cancer biology, or we think it's in cell biology, because in all those cases, people have done studies of reproducibility. In fact, there's a large-scale reproducibility project ongoing in, uh, in psychology right now as we speak. Um, then, for example, if you talk to industry, they tell you, well, we, re we routinely, unless uh, several independent labs, academic labs have reproduced something, we routinely disregard high-profile publication that claim to find some, some new effect. This is a book that just came out. I can warmly recommend it. It's by a medical philosopher, uh, Stigenda, in, in Cambridge, Medical uh, Nihilism, by which he means not that modern medicine doesn't have some very effective uh, treatments. He says explicitly, uh, there's no place I'd rather be after a serious accident than an emergency room of a clinic. And of course, there's a few magic bullets like insulin, like uh, penicillin, like Levec. But the vast majority of uh, medical interventions, including lipids and um, uh, uh, antidepressants, uh, uh, serotonin uptake inhibitor, etc., are probably at best ineffectual. And so, uh, one, there are many culprits here. One of them is, for example, a very strong and publication bias that, of course, we all know. You only publish positive results. Negative results are very difficult to establish. So the literature is full of positive results, whether there be uh, clinical trials that prove, supposedly, you know, show the effectiveness of some medical intervention, or a report about, you know, cellular intervention or behavioral intervention or channel rhodopsin intervention over whatever it is, and it's much more difficult to publish negative results, which is, of course, a huge source of bias. There's p-hacking, there's harping, there's all sorts of things, uh, bad statistical practice that we, we, we all undergo. Um, <coughs> all right, so one way to get around that is to do la what, for example, astronomy has done. Astronomy, of course, also suffers from the issue that we don't have. You can't intervene in astronomy. <laughs> You can't just turn the sun on or off or something like that, unlike in biology. But what astronomy has done over the last 100 years, they've done these large-scale surveys. 
uh, which are hypothesis free. And of course, your grant, your NIH uh, program officer doesn't like a hypothesis free um, R01, right? You have to have some particular hypothesis to chase down. But then, of course, you're very biased in finding results in favor of that uh, hypothesis. So one way to try to get at uh, the reproducibility is to l do large-scale um, unbi uh, unbiased surveys. Of course, nothing is ever un truly unbiased. You can just try to be as explicit about your bias and describe them in detail and discuss them in le at length with all your colleagues. And then also to make all the data available so that if you don't you know, trust our data, well, here's our data, and here's our metadata, and here's our Jupyter notebooks, and this is how we Every, this is how we got from the raw data to the final paper in, um, in, the, in the publication, including all the parameters. So you can yourself, A, reproduce it, and B, you can play around and you know, maybe find other statistical relationship between variables in the data. And I think it's absolutely essential going forward for science if we really want to be successful, in particular in delivering, in the, uh, the, delivering on the promise of, of neuroscience for therapeutic value, which is what most people care about, we have to practice these, um, uh, these techniques. All right, so the vision is uh, uh, coming from Caltech, where we have a large number of astronomical sites. This is one, it's called so-called 30-meter telescopes. It's supposed to be built 10 years ago on Mount Kea in Hawaii. It's a w w w would have been or could be the world's biggest telescope, 30 meter, with independently uh, steered mirrors. However, due to uh, uh, protest, local protest on Mount um, Kea, it hasn't been built and probably will never be built. But the point about these um, um, observatories is whether they're terrestrial based or space based, they, they, they collect, they have separated the process of building instruments from the process of, of analyzing the data. So in astronomy, there are really three communities. There's the theoretical community, the, uh, the cosmologist. Then there are the, um, the community of uh, engineers and physicists and software people who build the instruments and who run these large-scale sites. And then there's the third category of uh, astronomers who, let's say, work on solar astronomy or extra galactic radio sources. Uh, you know, or black holes or whatever they do. And w the way they work, they apply for observational time on a particular telescope. And since observational time is always a scarce resource, they, um, they have to compete with, with other proposals. And then the best proposals are chosen. And then, you know, they, they observe whatever they observe with the relevant instrument. And then, you know, sometimes later, the, the PI gets uh, um, um, all the data and all the metadata and for analysis. This is, how, uh, this is how astronomy works, or incidentally also particle accelerator. I'd, and, and the idea is when, when I came, uh, and we wrote about this together with uh, Clay, Clay Reed and I, who was sort of the, 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 key, the, the senior PIs in this effort, we, we wrote about this and so that we imagined that we'll, we'll set up an, um, uh, an observatory that would be open ultimately to the community, which we're doing now, where people such as yourself can apply, uh, we'll talk a little bit about that, C can apply for observational time. Well, we have different sets of instruments. Uh, now, of course, again, astronomy in some sense is vastly simpler. There's only one sky. There's a standard coordinate system. You can't intervene in the sky, so it's much, much different um, uh, from biology, where, of course, you have different animals. There's no you know, unique coordinate system. You can do a vast number of different behavioral manipulations. Um, and so it's much more challenging. And so we'll see in the fullness of time whether this works out. But the instruments we wanted from a mouse, this is all mouse, and we have focused on vision because, you know, and for a variety of idiosyncratic reasons, we, we, we focus on vision, doesn't have to be. We wanted three sets of instruments. We wanted multi photon imaging. We have 2P and 3P cellular imaging. Uh, 1P wide field imaging, think of that like the equivalent of fMRI albeit at the single, at the single tri level where we can survey the entire dorsal surface of the, of the mouth, and then high density electrical recordings. And we're talking here about sort of at the time we, um, we're imagining thousands, now we're talking about tens of thousands uh, of neurons that we can image uh, simultaneously in a standard way. So that's how we started off um, uh, back in uh, uh, seven years ago. All right. So in parallel at the, at the institute, the 10-year the plan that we initiated was to focus 
a lot of resources onto primary visual cortex just to really understand um, this, uh, highly, this you know, highly complex piece of, of excitable matter. So we, we, we are generating the data via a series of pipelines. So you'll see that here, um, the observatory. Yesterday evening, I talked about the cell types. In the mouse, at least initially, it was all focused on V1, the morphology, the electrophysiology, and the transcriptomics. Then we have a very detailed connectivity atlas that in detail analyzes all the masses of amount of projection going into visual cortex and leaving visual cortex. I won't talk about that. I talked about that last night. We're building this brain observatory, and I also won't talk about it. We have this very uh, major effort under Clay Reed and Nuno da Costa, where we have now reconstructed, uh, where we've cut and sectioned an image, and are now re uh, reconstructing, together with Sebastian Sang, a cubic millimeter of, um, of visual cortex. So this really requires, particularly if you want to do imaging under standard condition, that you have an exact standardized map. Now, in mice, we can do that, unlike in humans, where it's much more difficult. We can do it in mice because these are inbred mice. These are not wild type, but this, these are C57, uh, 6J mice that... How many of you are doing mouse experiments? Anybody? One. Okay. Well, two. Well, so the, uh, the, 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 uh, the majority of mouse researchers, of which there are like 4,000 labs in the world, use uh, what one type of breed, for better or worse. It's a monoculture out there, by and large. It has advantages, of course, also has disadvantages. And so that's the mouse we use, C57, black, 6J. Um, um, and then, of course, you can, so here we are superimposing the brains of 1,300 of these mice. You can see, you can really see uh, lots of features, including um, um, uh, whiskers, etc. So it really tells you, you know, they, they are much more standardized because it's, uh, these are all um, inbred um, uh, uh, animals that have very similar uh, genomes. So this is the advantage of having this CCF, which is, uh, so we developed this over the last uh, eight years, a series of them that everybody now uses. So we have roughly a half a billion pixels, and so we know that, that uh, individual pixels, 10 by 10 by 10 micrometer, so we know exactly where we are, whether we are doing an OFIS recording with optical physiology or with, electric, with uh, neural pixel, or we're doing um, a patch or any, any other manipulation, we know, pretty, we know exactly where we are with that sort of um, resolution. And we have a detailed atlas that has roughly 900 different regions, again, so um, no matter where you are in the, in, the, in the mouse, if you refer to it here, everybody knows where, what we're talking about. So it's really essential if you want to do a highly reproducible science. All right. Then we also develop this. This is just all a lot of infrastructure that you need to develop. It's as sexy as uh, toilet plumbing. <laughs> but believe me, if you've all been in this case, if your toilet at home doesn't work, you're in trouble. <laughs> And so you need to develop this. Uh, for example, you need to develop standard uh, protocols. So we spend a lot of time working with other people in the field to develop this uh, data standard, which is, it's not the data standard yet. I hope it will be, which allows people to do any sort of cellular imaging, whether it's electrophysiology or, or um, uh, optical physiology. It's called Neural Data Without Border. So there's its own web page, there's various release, there's now a 2.0, NWB 2.0 release. So it includes data and, and, and metadata in a standard format where then anybody can download these data and analyze them. And uh, there's some, um, uh, there are Python version, there's MATLAB version. Uh, you can open them up and you can do all your basic analysis. I think you're going to talk about some of that, right? So Michael will talk a little bit about that. And uh, everything we do, we release NWB, and a few other labs are now uh, also using NWB. Uh, NIH is strongly encouraging it. That's for cellular level data. Um, so yeah, so the, this brain observatory has, uh, has a number of components. So there's um, wide field imaging. I won't, uh, uh, wide field imaging and two photon imaging. I'll talk a bit about that, and then Michael will talk much more. There is um, a neural pixel, I'll talk about that. And then there is um, an entire modeling effort where we try to do either point model because we have the position of all the neurons here, or, or we do very detailed biophysical model, or we do more high level population statistics, uh, statistic model or machine intelligence models. I won't talk about that. All right, so, ah, I forgot my mouse. Wait, I have a mouse. 
mouse brain. A C57, of course. <laughs> so, okay, so this is the mouse brain. Here, it's actually affected two. So, uh, all right. So, if you want to pass it on, so this is there's thousands of papers written on this brain. So that's the actual size printed directly from the CCR 3D printed. And this is a keychain holder. So this is a factor eight bigger, two linearly, two X, Y, and Z. So this guy has 74 million neurons. And as I showed you yesterday, you know, cell type is not that different from human cell types. <coughs> yeah, so, so uh, this is the mouse brain front to back. Here we are in the, uh, so the eyes are somewhere here. They go uh, from the eyes to the, to the LGN. This is another part of the thalamus called the LP. Think of it like the monkey or the human uh, palvina. And then here are the visual areas at the back, roughly where they are in our case, uh, that we study. So there are six visual areas, um, visual cortical areas that we study. Of course, the, the visual input from the eye goes to two, more than two dozen different areas. So, in fact, a massive projection goes to the colliculus, but that, uh, a somewhat smaller projection goes to the LGN, but there are lots and lots of other um, uh, projection. We're studying cortical one because we're interested in cortex, and of course, uh, in us, it's the, um, it's the dominant one. Yeah, so here you can see this network of, uh, of different areas, LGN, V1, these higher order areas, and then there's these, um, uh, the, other, um, the other visual thalamic nucleus called LP. As I said, think of it like the, like the palvina. And we can do routine uh, imaging. So this is wide field imaging. We do this in every mouse. So think of it like fMRI. So we do that before we do cellular imaging or before we do neural pixel imaging. So we know exactly when we have our neural pixel electrodes where we put them in here. Or when we do um, optical physiology, we know exactly where we are with respect to these maps. Right? So we're trying to do the functional maps in, well, we are doing the functional maps in each animal. And of course, then we have the standard anatomical, because we have its brain and we always reconstruct its brain afterwards. So I think that's really important to know where to have high confidence uh, in where you are. So there's this bevy, so this is primary visual cortex. And then there are these bevies of, of other higher order visual areas. So people have identified roughly 12 different visual areas. Some other sensory is over here, auditory is over there, front is there, back is here, medial is here. All right, so we have this, uh, this standard, what we call a pipeline. So pipeline is a set of procedures that are highly standardized. So unlike, um, um, unlike at, at, at university where, where you, the, 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 the grad student, have to do all of this by yourself, for better or worse, and you learn from your predecessor, so we operate slightly differently. We have a, a series of uh, detailed white papers and detailed standard SOPs, standard operating procedures, where we write down in as much detail as humanly possible, we write down the exact procedures that we undertake. And so if we get a new team member, they get sort of indoctrinated into the, into the SOP method. So we try again to, to, uh, to do things as, um, as similar as possible. Of course, occasionally we have to change because we discover there's some better way of doing it, but there's a change management process. The drawback of this is so the advantage of, of doing things standardized is that they're highly standardized and highly reproducible. The drawback is it's difficult to change things. You can't just sort of every day twiddle and optimize things like you can do in a university lab. That's a drawback, but it, it comes with the advantage that things that you can compare things across days and weeks and months. Okay, so we, you know, we, we do the surgery, we let the animal recover, we do the intrinsic imaging, we habituate the animal. If we do a behavioral training, we, we, we train the animal, we do image, we do the, the functional imaging or the neural pixel recording. We again do um, um, imaging, um, uh, you know, because this functional imaging may have been a week or two weeks or longer if there's behavior go ongoing. And then we do the reconstruction of the, of the brain so we know where we are and we also look for brain damage. So we, we have an engineering team, uh, a team of 14 engineers or so, 
that build uh, all these little widgets and gadgets and you know 3D models, CAD CAM models. You can access all of that if you want to do. We, we spend great amount of uh, time and effort into making things, again, very reproducible. So we have these reticules. We try to position things highly accurate from one animal to the next. So these are made, each of these is made for each animal and 3D printed. So we can uh, go back now up to 10 times over 10, 10 consecutive uh, days of imaging um, and find the, the same cells again. That's the advantage doing it in, in um, uh, uh, using optical um, imaging. Okay, so for the brain observatory that I'll talk about for the optical and that um, Michael will talk about, we did this standard. Uh, we wanted to know what is the response of a large number of cells to standard battery of visual stimuli that people have used over the last 30 years, which is drifting grading, you know, uh, drifting in various direction, various speeds, appropriate to the animal. The resolution of the animal is roughly 50 times worse than us. Uh, static ratings, locally sparse noise, then natural scenes uh, from, a da from natural scenes database and movies. So originally we used Touch of Evil. How many of you have seen this? It's a great movie, Touch of Evil. We chose Touch of Evil, I think you chose it. Because it has this well, uh, because it has this long, uh, long opening, single shot opening sequence. Uh, but now these days we, we show a more diversity of movies, particularly natural movies from nature shows, because we figure mice haven't seen too many um, movies that take place on the Mexican-American border and involve drugs. Um, and then uh, spontaneous imaging. And then these are so here in the data you'll see in the first part. We're doing three imaging sessions over three consecutive days uh, in many animals. So the hope was, it di didn't quite turn out to be that case, that if we use different transgenic lines, we can do uh, imaging in different populations of cells, which is true. So what do I mean by that? So these are different lines that we build. We, 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 we build more transgenic lines, certainly for Cortex than anyone else. We make them available through Jackson. So any of these you can order. Some of them are very popular. Where we have um, um, a fluorescent um, uh, calcium indicator, uh, uh, GCAM6, we use either 6S or 6F. Uh, expressed in particular subtype of cells, right? So we can, th this is the advantage of doing optical imaging. It comes with drawbacks, I'll talk about that. But the advantage is that you can do imaging in particular genetically identified subtypes of cells. So you only image, for example, in excite, we have some lines, like the EMX line, that images in excited three cells in layer two, three, four, and five. Or you can, the, this Rob B line only does um, um, uh, um, imaging in layer four excitatory cells. On layer five excitatory cells, we have one that's layer six. And then we have some inhibitory ones. Uh, uh, SST, VIP, these are very interesting, and now PV. So that's the advantage of, of using this technology. We used uh, 10 different excitatory lines. Unfortunately, this didn't quite pan out and uh, two inhibitory lines. And then for each one, so these are the different lines, or some of the different lines, again, we do this imaging, um, this, in, uh, this intrinsic imaging to ascertain, you know, do they all have uh, normal maps, etc. There's a belief, of course, in the field that transgenic animals are basically normal, happy animals, although they will have something changed in their genome, right, because you had to insert something to get a specific, to get your, for example, your GCAM, your genetic encoded uh, um, calcium indicator expressed in a specific genetic subtype of cells with a specific promoter. And in some of these animals, you not only insert one gene or two genes, but you may have to insert three or four genes. And once again, if you do sort of long studies of the, over many years of these uh, lines, you'll see, unfortunately, that some of these lines don't, aren't exactly like wild type. They're not just like happy mice that happen to have this magic thing that makes uh, layer four cells um, uh, 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 glow when they, when they fire action potentials. All right, so the, the first survey took us a long time to set up because we had to set up the entire machinery of, of building these, um, uh, the, this highly reproducible set of instruments in behaving animals, which we certainly had, and no one in the field had ever done before. 
And so the, the f first survey is now coming out in, um, in Nature Neuroscience. Uh, it's in six cortical areas, three hours of these visual stimuli using two photon calcium imaging using this, this calcium encoder. Everything is freely and publicly accessible. You can download it. People have downloaded several thousand times the manuscript. It, f it went last year uh, on, um, on the bio server. The data is available since two years. The paper is available since one year, and the actual paper comes out. Now, the actual work is really led by, by three uh, brilliant young scientists that came, uh, that joined us they are, uh, as um, um, investigators. So uh, Saskia de Vries, Jerome Lecoq, and Michael. Michael Beis is, uh, is here, is going to be talking more about this. All right, so the, the standard view is this, a view that, uh, that I grew up, that you guys probably, uh, yeah, that you guys also grow, uh, grew up with, because it's part of our, all of our textbooks in neuroscience is that early visual cortex in humans, or in monkeys, or in cats, or in, in other mammals, um, they're sort of the standard model where cells have a well-defined receptive field. So they're looking at the world through these little uh, or larger receptive field. And you can essentially get their spiking responses by taking, you know, by doing a convolution of whatever stimulus uh, falls into this receptive field, passing it through some uh, nonlinearity like a halfway rectification and squaring or some sort of normal and, and then some sort of normalization. Um, that's sort of the standard model. Of course, it's also used in all, in all um, or in many neural networks. Um, so this, uh, this was one of several articles that appeared. The other one was by Bruno Aushausen that sort of questioned this and said, well, to what extent do we actually know is, uh, that this model is the case? And to, or to what extent do we, do we know for what fraction of cells does this model hold? Is it only true for a very small subset of cells that we happen to record from because they are the shouting the loudest? Right? Because you have to remember, if you do electrophysiology with an electrode, classical electrophysiology, you drive your cells blind into cortex. You're listening to an auto monitor until you come to a cell that brrrp, 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 that's nicely modulated. And that's the one that you're recording from. So that's like interviewing people in the country that shout the loudest. And you're only going to interview the people that sh happen to shout the loudest. So you're going to get a, a view, but you're going to get a biased view, a possibly biased view. All right. So here you can see uh, the mouse watching Touch of Evil, the movie. And there you can see uh, uh, so the flickering activity. So typically we get, I don't know, on the order of well, 60 or 70 uh, cells. Uh, Michael, what's the average number of excitatory um, cells that we see in a, in a single field of view? Like 60? 180. 180, OK. So we can record simultaneously a uh, at frame rate. So this is slow frame rates. This is, but this is typical. This is what two photon calcium imaging is. It's 30 hertz. And then we track the eye to make sure we know where the animal is looking and to regress against that. All right, and then some more housekeeping. We have this. I, again, we think this, this gives rise to high quality data that after the, fa after the imaging has been done, we, we're still doing um, checks for, for quality control. So we have lots of quality control checks. And the people who are doing the quality control typically may not know the end result or the, the, how good the data was, again, to keep it as unbiased as possible. So from the 422 mice for this particular paper that enter this pipeline that goes through the surgery, the intrinsic imaging, the, um, the two photon calcium imaging, and then the histology, lots of them get um, um, and rejected. So the two biggest sources are brain health, that if we look at in detail at the brain, in histology, it doesn't look as good as it should, and we reject the, the animal, even though it has, may have been imaged, and we get Z-drift, although this is, we've managed to reduce this now. All right, and then we have this, so you can go online and look at all these cells. And, and uh, Michael's going to talk more uh, about you. So you can download 60,000 cells and get for, e uh, for, many of the, for, for each of them, in principle, up to three hours of uh, worth of, um, of responses. And so we quantify this. We spend a lot of time generating these cute plots that I'm not trying to decode for you. Here, for example, you can see these are so-called corona plots. This shows you the response. So we show 101 natural scenes. And each one you can see, okay, this natural scene 
uh, this cell responded on multiple trials to this one very strong, to this uh, image somewhat weaker, and to most of the images hardly at all. Or you can look at the, uh, the, the, um, in the receptor field, or you look in, at the natural movies, or you can look at the drifting grating, the response to drifting grating. So it's a quick way to summarize. And then there's an SDK software development kit that, Alan, uh, that Michael is going to talk about that allows you to download all of this and analyze and do orientation tuning curves and correlation curves and whatnot. All right, something else we did. We wanted to know, so everybody records from two photon calcium imaging and publishes paper on it and assumes these are the cellular responses and most people think, oh, cellular responses really is like spiking responses. But it isn't. And there are a few people of course, who have done this. For example, Carl Svoboda has done this work. It's very difficult, it's very demanding. So what we did here in, an, in, in these animals, we simultaneously recorded using two photon calcium imaging and then um, while we are patching, uh, lose a cell attached patch from one of the cells. So in other words, we get ground zero. We know what its actual electrical behavior is, whether it spikes or doesn't spike. And, we can co and so now we can compare its electrical behavior to the observed optical imaging data. And the bad news is, well, so here we plot. This is um, an analysis done by uh, one particular scientist. Uh, and under su uh, supervision of Michael here. So this shows you for two different uh, excitatory lines, layer two, three lines in, in cortex. This is the probability uh, of detecting uh, an event in the calcium imaging. So we use a method, a theoretical method, um, uh, that extracts events known as L0 events. And Michael will tell you more about it. So we, we get these calcium image, these changes from fluorescent delta F over F. And then we extract significant events. And, and this is what many people do. And the question is, what's the relationship between those significant calcium events and the underlying spiking events? I mean, Hodgkin, Huxley, fast action potential. And here we plot the actual spikes we measured using the loose attached electrode. And here we attach the probability of detecting one of those calcium events, the L0 events. And you can see, OK, if there are no spikes, the signal basically doesn't respond. So it's a very low false positive. That's good. But what's not so good, if you have one spike, there's less than a 5% chance of getting an L0, a calcium uh, a change in, in calcium fluorescence. Only if you have four or five spikes within half a second, you get like 70% you know, chance of detecting an event. So these are different time windows. So essentially, what we're seeing, and this is the strength of the event, essentially what we're seeing when, when you're looking at two photon calcium imaging data, you're seeing sort of bursts of spikes, three, four, five, six, seven spikes within an observational window, let's say half a second or a quarter of a second or three quarters of a second, okay? You're not, you, will never, you will always never pick up individual spikes or two spikes that fire within you know, 200 milliseconds or something like that. All right, that's the weakness of, of all calcium, Im uh, calcium imaging uh, streams. So here we have, uh, we have four example cells just to see what... So here we have the... Um, this, is the this is the delta F over F trace. This is, the, uh, this is how we infer, these are the events and the magnitude of these L0 events that we in infer for this particular. So this is uh, an inhibitory somatostatin line. This is another inhibitory VIP line. Those are two excitatory lines. This is a response. So these cells are, are tuned to this particular orientation. That uh, cell is tuned. This one cell isn't tuned at all. This one is also tu uh, t uh, tuned to static grating. These cells respond to a few image natural scenes here, four, they're only to two. And this shows you the movie. So the, um, we repeat the movie, uh, in this case, 10 times. And this shows you the, uh, the response to each, uh, um, uh, each repetition of this movie. So it, what this, it shows that the cell responds very reliable to something happening in the movie here, or there, or there, or there. So it responds quite reliable. And these are the receptor fields. All right, so um, Michael will go into more detail in this, uh, um, um, of this result. Here I'm just highlighting two results. One is uh, 
it's a very sparse code that we find in this optical imaging. It's a very sparse code. And, we, and some of this we're now replicating using neural pixels. So here we compute, li uh, we compute lifetime sparseness and population sparseness. So this is the measure, comes from Jack Alain, that essentially, uh, well here. So here, for example, we have a response of one particular cell to different natural scenes. And most of the time, it responds to most natural scenes with either nothing or with a tiny response. But for some natural scenes, it responds you know, uh, with, a, with, a, with a large response, as you can see here. So this has a high lifetime sparseness. Lifetime sparseness of one, on the limit of one, means it only responds to one thing, this cell. Lifetime sparseness of zero means it responds to everything equally. So this one here is, it's a much lower lifetime sparseness. Okay? You can, and then you can do the same population sparseness. You can, so here you're asking one cell, how does one cell respond to different images shown over the, the three uh, days, uh, the three imaging sessions. Or you can ask, given that I'm seeing 180 cells in this one window, what is, the, uh, what, what is their response? So that's the, um, that's the population sparseness. And here we have a lot of data packed into, we spent a lot of time into making comprehensible uh, ways to illustrate the data. I think at, at least they're aesthetically appealing. At least we'd like to believe. So here we, this is a called a pause print. So this is V1, the response of V1, and this is a response of LM, AL, PM, AM, PM. So these are the different, six different areas that we image. At the challenge we have, we have massive amount of data. We've got 60,000 cells. We've got all these different tuning properties. So how do we best represent that? You know, so you can either go through individual uh, plots, you know, till the cows go home, or you can try to, abstra uh, to abstract. And so here we do this pause. We show, for example, the response in all these different areas in layer five, in layer four, in layer two, three. And I'm not going to go. In, and here, here we see it in one area. This is in V1 for the different Cree lines. So you can see, for example, VIP cells uh, tend to be very uh, proliferous. They respond to. Um, um, quite indiscri indiscriminately to things, while SST cells are very, um, are very discerning. They're much more discerning. So you have two very different classes of inhibitory cells. And then you get these excitatory cells, uh, you know, uh, lines, and they have a sort of a complex pattern of responses. But the bottom line cells are sparse to both um, natural stimuli as well as population um, sparseness. And this doesn't quite accord with the view that no matter what comes into view of the receptor field, the cell will always respond. Is all of this average over speed? No, so uh, this is, no, here we don't, uh, I mean, so, so we, we've done a totally separate analysis where we regress against, uh, against running speed. So running speed is the best value, right? This one is, I think this is the average over running speed, right? All of this ignores running speed. Yep. One point, that's the one point I wanted to make, sparse. B, I'm just going to talk about this. So here we plot the cells that are responsive. And by responsive, we, we mean we take the, the stimulus they respond best to. So here, let's say we do different gratings that move in eight different directions. And we pick the, the grating that the cell is most responsive to. And we plot, well, how often, how often um, does it respond to its optimal stimulus, the, the, the stimulus that evokes the strongest response? Um, and here you can see, you know, it's on average the median is like around 50 percent. You know, many cells respond to their best stimulus less than 50 percent of the time. Some, like SST, respond again highly reliable. VIP, incredibly incredible variable. So there's a great deal of variability, right? So cells, even to the optimal stimulus, the one that really turns them on respond on average less than half the time. And then the last thing we did this, um, we wanted to, to ascertain, all this, all, all this hides a lot of work, and, and Michael is going to unpack some of that. A lot of work by a lot of people. Where we take, okay, this cano the standard canonical model, where, uh, where we take a receptor field, um, either just a linear receptor field, uh, you know, in and out of phase, or uh, quadrature, um, and receptor field, we pass it through some nonlinearity, and then we regress. We include a, um, a running speed um, variable, 
as a weight, and then we, uh, we compare it against the response, right? just to see how well does the standard model fit. And yes, we find some cells here. This is, these cells are all V1. Uh, some cells where it actually does very well. So the red is the, this is over, uh, over time, this is uh, 30 hertz frame rates. So here we have a cell that responds to both the natural stimuli, i.e. the natural scenes and the natural movie, um, as well as to artificial stimuli, i.e. The, uh, the grating, the, the stationary grating or the moving grating quite well and really responds pretty much as you would expect to. I mean, not perfectly, but, uh, but really quite well. Now you also have some cells that respond well to natural stimuli, but respond, you know, they don't respond at all to artificial stimuli, to the gratings. You have some cells that respond well to very, that can be very well fitted, their standard model. The standard model fits very well the response to gratings, but not to natural scenes or to natural movies. And then you have cells like this, that just, you know, where you get these effectively zero regression coefficients. Now it turns out, if we look at all cells, and this is uh, I think this is 15,000 cells. Ah, there it is, yeah. So if you look at, so I just showed you those four examples. So here, here we plot the, uh, the, this regression against the model against responses for artificial stimuli. Here we do it for these natural stimuli, for, grating, uh, for the um, natural scenes and, and movies. And in general, you can see, yeah, they, they, uh, the, the cells respond better to natural stimuli than to artificial one. But you know, these are 15,000, so the vast number of cells are down here. And look at those correlation coefficients, they're tiny. So only 2% neurons respond you know, more than 0.5. So it's difficult to find cells that respond that, that follow the, the, um, and the standard model. And it turns out we've done cluster, detailed clustering analysis that Michael is going to talk to you more about. There's a class of cells we call none. And they don't really respond to any of the stimuli that we tried over three hours of running. And they're like one third of all of our cells fall fall into that, into that null category. So they're, they're there, we can see them, they do respond, but they respond to events that don't really respond to something obvious uh, on the screen, at least the, the stimuli that we've seen. So maybe it's, uh, it's something, maybe it's a very strange, or it's a very particular visual stimuli, like in IT, but this is V1, and in some of the other areas, it's rather early on, or they respond to some non-visual stimuli or to some combination that we have not latched onto. Okay, so that's the status of the, uh, of the, of the, of the current survey, where the mouse, has, uh, the, the mouse is free to run or not to run, so there's no, I should have said this earlier, there's no behavioral control. In this case, um, the mouse can sit. Many mice like to run, and so we're doing this imaging while the mouse does what it does. It's head, it's head fixed, of course, but there's no behavior. So we, we have, um, in the meantime, we're setting up more instruments. We in particular, we have this beautiful instrument that came to us from um, Karl Svoboda lab, uh, the, the, uh, the Genelia Mesoscope that we improved upon, so you can do, uh, we can do twice as, ma as many imaging as the original one. So this allows us now to do high resolution imaging with a better signal to noise than on the original scientific uh, scope uh, and using um, eight different areas. So what we can do, we can image in, uh, for instance, we image in two areas, like V1 and AM simultaneously. Simultaneously means at 30 hertz, simultaneous. And then we can do, uh, again, simultaneously imaging of uh, four imaging planes. So we, we can do Im he here, 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 and repeat that every, uh, I think we're doing that every 10 hertz. And you can see that here. So this is simultaneously in V1 and, and, and in higher order visual areas where we can see this is now, um, where, where we can see what the cells do in many different areas. So we're making that soon available to the community. And we're moving much more interesting. We have moved over the last year. It makes it even more challenging now to behavior. So in addition to doing all the imaging, we now also have a, to establish or have established a pipeline where the animal enters and we have to check its training. So we have supervised training, 
computer supervised training, where the animal in this case has to do a change detection task. Right, so we showed a series of natural scenes because we know cells do respond nice, some cells respond very nicely to natural scenes, albeit very sparse. So we show image blank, image blank, so this is at 250 milliseconds, blank 250 milliseconds, and then the image changes from one natural scene to another, and here the animal has to respond by licking, um, and then if it's correct, it gets uh, rewarded. If it's incorrect, it, uh, there's a timeout. Okay, um, the animals can do this quite well. It takes them like a, a week or two to, well, it takes them some time to habituate to the, to the entire setup, but once they're habituated, it takes them a week or two to do, uh, to do this training. So here you can see there the animal then licks and gets water, continues to run. All right, so now this is the same imaging under, um, under behavior. And so you can see what I told you already before. This is from an excitatory line. This shows you the raw fluorescent signal uh, normalized by it. So it's delta F over F. And you can see, so these colors are the different images. So there are eight different images. And it has to detect transition in principle between any of these images and any other. It has just to detect when the image changes. And here you can see. These, these excitatory cell line, it's a layer 2, 3 line, um, they respond quite sparsely to individual images, which is an interesting point. It's very different, certainly, from my uh, idea of V1, that the uh, cell in V1 will only respond to this image, but not to these other seven images. And this happens at the first stage of cortical processing already. Now, of course, this is two-photon calcium imaging. So we don't know, we don't have the resolution using uh, a two photon calcium imaging to see the exact temporal onset. To what extent, for example, given this is 30 hertz, is there feedback from higher order that makes these, uh, these responses so selective? So here you can see there's lots of interesting behavior. Um, it's a very rich, now here to mine, um, behavioral modification of cellular responses. So here you can see. The excitatory lines responding, as I said, to the eight different images. And you can see, so these are 2,000 cells. And you can see some cells respond very strongly, but only to particular images. Then, when, So this is on highly trained images. Here, on one day, we expose the mouse to a new set of eight images. It learns very quickly that the task is still the same, the tech change from one image to the same. But you get less sparse responses, and we find this highly reliable. So, if you train the animal for a week or two, the response gets very sparse. If you use new images, the animal can still do the task, but it's less sparse. And then also we see really interesting um, predictive signals when we're looking at, uh, for example, subtypes of inhibitory cells. Um, so here you can see the responses to, uh, so red, is this is an excitatory layer to three line. When the animal has, has, has uh, seen these images, eight images many times, and this is when the image is uh, the image set is new. And here, what we did, we left out on purpose. We omitted, so you can see they 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 always repeated a fixed interval. But here, we omitted one because we wanted to see well the mouse expects a response but doesn't expects an image but doesn't get an image. What happens? And you can see the VIP cells very reliable. They ramp up like they you know they they have some expectation about what happens, what should happen around zero, and it doesn't happen and they ramp up until the actual next signal comes. So this is just a teaser. There's lots of interesting data there. Of course, the data is much more interesting when the animal is under behavioral control and is actively doing a task that must involve V1. We know, because if we uh, take out V1 using uh, optogenetics by exciting all the interneurons, the animal can't do this task nearly as well. All right, so then we, over the last six years, we also worked together with uh, Janelia, with Tim Harris, to develop these neural pixels uh, that are very, very popular now. So it's really the next generation in electrical recording. Um, so it's a, it's a silicon technology. It's actually, it's 120 nanometers, it's not very aggressive, but it's a huge jump over conventional uh, microelectrodes where you have um, on a piece of silicon that's uh, 22, uh, 22 micrometer by 70 micrometer 
uh, thin, so it's thinner, it's a quarter of the size of human hair, and uh, these ones are 10 millimeter long. They're now uh, once, they're, they're once being developed for the monkey that are up to 49 millimeter long for monkey and possible um, uh, human use. And they have, they have amplification here, um, and then everything gets read out here at the, at the base of the, of the chip. It gets amplified up to factor 500 gain, multiplexed, f uh, digitized. So all you have is the USB connector uh, at the output of this. So you have 966 electrodes. You can read out 300. You can select which one you want to read out. You can read out 364 of them. They're very low impedance, very stable, very, very stable noise, six to seven microvolts. So they're really the next generation in, um, and they're now you can, uh, we insisted this when we built them, they are cheaply available. So for $10,000, anyone can set up a new recording lab and within a few months record from a thousand cells for, for, for each experiment. So here we have six of them. So uh, yeah, that's all the, uh, so it's really, you know, they weigh less than a quarter of a gram. People are now trying to make wireless uh, versions. We're also making versions with um, opto, uh, with uh, two optical channels on them. So you can not only record, but also send down two different uh, colored uh, beams of light to activate and, and activate options. And we're now also working on ones to, to not only read, but also write, in other words, to stimulate. It's very exciting technology development. Um, and in fact, we, we are just working now together with Nick Steinmetz, who's a young faculty at the University of Washington, and Tim at Genelia. We just got these where we have Neural Pixel Ultra, where they have even four times higher densities, so where we get an electrode every 6.25 micrometers in X and in Y. So we can get these ultra-dense fields, and so a lot of my early work, and I still love it, is the electrophysiology and of, uh, of, uh, of excitable neurons, which is why these are called neural pixels, because at every pixel we got now an electrical signal with, with very low, again, noise flows, a little bit higher, 8, eight microvolts. So we can really pinpoint, you may not know, but there's, there's a number of issues here associated with what's called, um, did you talk about the dark neurons? Okay, there's a problem of dark neurons, just like there is for dark matter. There's some neurons that don't show up on some electrodes, or they don't show up at all. They never seem to spike. Uh, and it may be because our electrodes are so crude, and only if you have really sm very small sampling can you, and particularly if they're symmetric, and the electric field is very compact, and you have a very big electrode, you won't see them. So you need uh, one way to, vis to possibly visualize them is using high-density electrodes. All right, um, yeah, so they're now commercially available. They're 1,200 euro per, and as I said, all you need is a USB, picks, uh, uh, a USB port that uh, plugs into a PIX board. Yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. We do understand neurons at the level of biophysics. We have a reasonable good understanding. Electrical fields, local electrical fields. So we have the same pipeline now that we do for OFIS, we have for EFIS. So here we have an animal, um, you know, it's a mock-up of an animal with six electrodes. And it's, so we have to do things slightly different here because we, we want to locate where those probes are. So we use uh, afterwards optical tomography imaging um, to, uh, to enable us to locate where those uh, electrodes are. So here, so we can, those are our six areas. And just like, you know, butterflies on a needle, we can stick electrodes through all of them. And in this case, we are fortuitous. If we know what we're doing, we can also get the superior colliculus, which of course gets a massive input from the retina, as well as the pulvina in the mouse called LP and the LGN. So we can get uh, on the order of 10 visual areas. Now this compares the response that you get uh, for neural pixel recording. So each one is, is a cell, and uh, the size of the bubble shows you the strength of the response. Uh, this one in AL. So in, if we do two photon calcium imaging, we get uh, this plane of cells at 30 hertz, 
on the order of 180 cells if it's an excited, excitatory line, many fewer if it's an inhibitory line because they're sparser. Now with neural pixels, we get all of those responses down through layer 6, through hippocampus, dental gyrus, C1, C3, and down into the LGN. And all the way down, if you wanted to, you can go all the way to the bottom of the brain. And we get this, this is why I love electrophysiology, we get this at 30 kilohertz, at 30,000 hertz, rather than getting those cells at 30 hertz. So at 30 hertz, those cells, versus all of this versus 30 kilohertz. So you can see, you know, this is just a mock-up. Uh, the fact that we get hippocampus is just due to the geometry of, um, of, um, of uh, recording. Yeah, so, you know, in a typical experiments now, you get overwhelming number of cells. So this is in a few experiments that we did uh, just to test the basic, um, uh, this, we call this pilot data, to best uh, test our basic setup, you know, 14,000 cells. And you can discover things that we couldn't see before because the electrode, the signal to noise is very low and the, the electrode are spaced closely together. So for example, I don't know, have you talked about back propagating action potential? So there are action potential that propagate not only from the soma, the site or the, the site where the action potential gets initiated at the axon hillock down the axon um, onto the uh, synapse and jumping across the synapse, but they can also propagate back uh, from the uh, uh, spike initiation zone up into the apical dendrites. And if you look carefully, we can see that here. In many cases of a subset of pyramidal cells in cortical structure and in, in, in cortical structures, we can see these, uh, these action potentials that back propagate very nicely, in, um, uh, in particular in hippocampus and in cortex. And here you can see the electrical signatures, and they have the right orientation. So sort of uh, where you can begin to do in vivo recordings, not only of classical action potential, but also dendritic action potentials uh, at large scale. So it's pretty cool. So why would you, you can uh, tell I'm very enthusiastic about EFIS, why would you want to do OFIS? Seems like a poor man version, right? Okay, so this is how I, I get this question very often, which is why I summarized it here. Uh, so OFIS uh, re um, recording, the, the advantages, the pros, is you can record from several hundred neurons from genetically identifiable populations. That's a huge advantage, right? So the neural pixel, you pick up everything that has an electrical action potential. Everything that shouts in, a, you know, in the electrical field, you pick up, and you don't know what the identity is. You can try to infer whether it's an interneuron or excitatory cell, but that's indirectly. So that's a big advantage if you have some specific hypothesis about a subset of cells being involved in a particular behavior. And of course, you can turn those neurons, if you genetically identify them, you can turn them on or off using opsins. And you can track them across multiple sessions. So it's easy, for example, no, it's not easy, but it's doable that you track the same set of neurons over 10 sessions. We do this now reliable, where we, we assure this is once one particular cell in the upper part of layer two, three that express a particular promoter, and we can do that on day one, on day two, and on day 10. You can't do that EFIS. EFIS, you're recording from all the neurons, and you retract the electrode, next thing you put it in again, you're recording from maybe the same or probably from different neurons, you have no idea. But the drawback is signal is slow, it's, it's 30 hertz. So you're completely, certain things are completely invisible to you. You don't know about high frequency oscillation, you don't know, you know, gamma and high gamma, all of that. You're blind to, you don't know anything about synchrony. Um, and then as I showed, the spikes aren't really related. The activity you see, uh, whether it's delta F over F or L, no, uh, L0, is not really spikes. It's indirectly related in a nonlinear, non-stationary manner to the underlying uh, action potential. It's difficult to reach deep structures because you're, you're imaging with photons, with two, two, uh, with two photons still, but you're limited, or even with three photons, you're limited to 600 micrometers, 700 micrometers, even with, seven, with, um, with uh, three photons. So in order to go to hippocampus, you have to remove the overlying cortex, which gets bloody, and you have to make lesion. Uh, the advantage of EFIS is you can record f per electrode now several hundred neurons, in a couple of years, that'll probably go to a few thousand neurons. You can do it in the entire brain. 
You can do it at a thousand times high temporal frequency. It's minimal invasive. And you really understand the physics, and it's easy to set up. The main drawback is you can't track neurons over multiple sessions, and you cannot, oh sorry, you can't ascertain the genetic identity. All right, last thing I want to talk about, which is the observatory model. So um, in, in, uh, this just shows the statistics from one particular observatory, the Keck Observatory in Hawaii. Which is partly run by Caltech, uh, which is run by Caltech and um, uh, University of California. We had a speaker from there, who who is a director, um, um, Hilton Lewis, who is a director from there, uh, speak to us. Uh, these are the number of uh, of uh, of papers that are published each year, but just based on his particular uh, on that particular observatory. And we want to do something the same, but now doing two foot and calcium imaging. So we have this whimsical drawing. So the idea is you will perform small scale experiments. You form a hypothesis. And then you, or you don't, may, may not even do have a small scale uh, experiment. You just have an interesting hypothesis about what goes on, let's say, in, in the areas in the back of the mouse brain with a particular stimulus in a particular transgenic animal, for instance. And then you submit a uh, protocol to the open scope request for proposal. We just had two of them. We're going to release a third one in the um, next month, right? Um, the proposals are reviewed by internal, and ex uh, internal referee, uh, re um, referees inside the Allen Institute and by external referees. So we're not, uh, we don't bias that. Uh, and then we perform, we would perform these, the, 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 the experiments that come out of this refereeing uh, process, you, what you have to commit if you apply to it, you have to commit that you're doing data analysis because it takes us significant effort and time and money ultimately, right? We have to pay the people and pay for all the infrastructure for each experiment. So you have to promise us that and you have to uh, specify ahead of time, these are the types of analysis I'll do with, with, with this data. And you, know, you, have to, you, you have to give a detailed uh, justification for your data plan and then you publish the data. And the data, a year later, I think, has to be made public. This is run by, by Jerome Lecoq, who comes to us from, from, from Stanford. So first call, we got 33 proposals. Uh, and we're doing these, we have done these three stimuli. This involves people from uh, university, as well as, as well as from DeepMind and uh, Google. This is involving the Tononi lab. And this is an internal, uh, because our own people also want to run their own experiments uh, on this open scope, because it's much easier to do things than on, this, on these big pipeline proposals. We just opened it up for, for, well, last year we opened it up for a second round, got a lot of proposals, and selected three of them, and, um, and are executing them now. And now we're going to go through the, next, uh, through the next request for proposal. So once again, if you're interested in doing this, it doesn't cost you anything. There, there will be a request for proposal. And then you, uh, you, know, you can submit something. It's best to contact us ahead of time, because certain things we can, do, we can easily adjust. Certain other things are very difficult. You know, we don't have infinite flexibility. We try and become more flexible to have other surgical windows, other sites or where you can observe other brain parts. But it's, uh, it's a non-trivial process. But I think it's an exciting one towards moving towards this uh, open, uh, open observatory model. And with that, I'm finishing my talk. This is, um, this is our large team who supports all of that. And as I said yesterday, that's our visionary founder who, uh, who funded all of that and who kept us asking the hard questions. And his voice is gone now, so we have to internalize his asking the hard questions. And, um, but he's enabled all of that. And with that, I thank you.